I mean, I don't know what people would do at large if they had to live with this knowledge that, that uh, there's nothing they can do and that accident and catastrophe are imminent. It's really quite impossible to live that way. Worried about every car that goes by and when your kid is going to school. You just can't live this way. And yet, actually, this is the way things happen, isn't it? The planet runs, runs this way. So the human life, the, 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 the sort of the natural craziness of human life, the fact that people are, in effect, daily, lead crazy daily lives, is a result of the craziness of their position. I bring this out, I think, in the, in the denial of death and in the second edition of the birth of death of the How natural it is for man to be a crazy animal because of the crazy life that he has. Because of his knowledge of death. I'm growing increasingly suspicious of all, of all, of all idealisms and all hopefulnesses. And uh, people who talk about these hopefulnesses and talk about the togetherness and talk about possibilities, I'm just very suspicious of all these things. I, uh, I think we're, I think works like Endgame and and Zombler's Planet and and uh, the team and the what the lieutenant. Uh, Malum of the tenant. I think these are, I think these are, are, the, are the true works of our time. The terrible, hopeless isolation of people from uh, Kafka. And uh, I don't, I can't grab it. To me, it seems like grabbing a straw is to talk about left brain, right brain uh, types of uh, relationships. They were overlooking the radiating influences and influences. I don't, I can't, I'm not comfortable there anymore. It's so hard dying in our culture and, and, and I think that as, just as a person you must have a lot that, that could be added alongside of uh, what you have said, you know, when you were not so close to the experience. Uh, I don't really have anything to add except to say that, uh, you know, to repeat what others have already said, and that is that there's you know, it's really nothing new. And that is that what makes it easier is, is to be able to, to transcend the world into some kind of religious dimension. And that's the only, it's the only thing that, uh, that's, I would say it's the most important thing, to know that beyond the absurdity of one's life, beyond the apparent injustice of things, beyond the human viewpoint, beyond what's happening to us, there is the fact of the tremendous creative energies of the cosmos, which are using us for some purposes we don't know. One very important aspect of my, my writings, or one point I would bring out that I think might easily be overlooked, and that is that if you take the growing up process of the child, which is essentially a masking over of his own fears and anxieties, right, with a secure cultural screen that protects him against the knowledge of his creatureliness, I think that's pretty secure. This is what character armor is. Mm -hmm. But the most interesting part of that whole business is that what the child does without knowing it is, since he feels powerless, and since he knows, on some level of his personality, that he's very, very vulnerable, he has to reinforce his sense of power. And he does this by plugging into a source of other power. Literally, almost, I, I like to look at an electrical circuit. Mm -hmm. The father, mm -hmm. the mother, or in some cases, the, the cultural system of ideas or ideology, this becomes his power source. And this is always unconscious. One doesn't know that what, what one's power source is. One doesn't know that he has given over the aegis of his life to this power source and that he himself is merely plugged into it. And I think the greatest deception of social life is that you talk about people who are centered. Well, there, there's no such thing. There's no center in people. People are not centered. People are 
utterly dependent on others for their feeling of strength. And you see it happen when somebody loses a father and they break down completely, mm -hmm. or a mother feel helpless. And it's then that's revealed to them that in fact they weren't standing on their own feet. And we see people who occupy places, we think that man is standing over there, who's speaking and standing on his own feet, but he's not. He's speaking from delegated, delegated powers, mm -hmm. which explains in the most direct way, of course, Stanley Milgram's work, you know, uh, the inability to disobey authority. Mm -hmm. Well, then one has no authority. So how can, he dis how can he disobey? People do not feel that they have the strength to disobey authority. This is the most striking thing about, uh, about human beings. When it comes to crucial decisions, I mean, crucial moral and ethical decisions. On a day-to-day -day basis, you do make your own decisions. Of course, if you're a cabinet maker, you decide what wood and so on to use, and you look like you're a person going through the world on your own. But in fact, and this is what comes out in, in, in therapy, isn't it, and personality breakdown, is that it, what is revealed to the person is that he's not, he's not his own, he's not his own person. We're he's all a possessed. Yeah. We're all possessed. He's a construct. He's lying. The lie in his life is that he's tried to pretend that he was his own person. Tell me about your self-analysis. Well, this was, I think this was a very, this was a very big event in my life, lasting over a period of years. Supposedly something that can't be done. And yet, of course, all the early psychoanalysts, Freud and so on, claim to have done it. So I think it can be done. But it, it's very hard, and it's very accidental. It requires a certain concatenation of circumstances that are very, very unique. But I was in a period of my life where I was experiencing great anxiety. And <coughs> suddenly, suddenly started to experience great anxieties. It was a transition period in my 30s, early 30s. And I, had, and I wanted to find out why I was experiencing this anxiety. And I said to myself, what the heck is bothering me? What is this thing? What is bothering me? And at that time, I was into psychoanalysis very, very deeply. I was reading about it. And I read a couple of very good books on dream analysis. Uh, Fromm's book, uh, Forgotten Language few other very good things. I don't remember what they were at the time. And I thought that this would be a good time to, uh, to try it myself. <laughs> Except that, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you don't remember your dreams. <laughs> so I took a night pad, like the one you have there, with a big, thick pencil. And I decided, and I took it to bed every night. And then when I would wake in the middle of the night from a particularly striking dream, I would write out what the dream was in the dark, the scroll, but I could always read it the next day. And I would write out what feeling I had at certain points in the dream. And then I'd wake up in the morning and there would be the night pad with, with, with my dream on it. Sometimes, most of all, I was very surprised that it was there. And I forgot I'd gotten completely about the thing. In a half sleep, in other words, I had written down the dream and my reaction to it. And of course, as often happens with these things, your dream, in fact, gives you a salient message. I think that the unconscious, in that sense, and many people have said it, the unconscious tells you what's bothering you. And the unconscious wants to help you get over it. It's a very, it's a very strange and yet real phenomenon. In other words, you get what are called message dreams. Dreams which tell you what is wrong and what is bothering you, which you can never, your ego will never tell you. Because the ego, of course, is a defensive mechanism. And uh, I've had a couple of, I remember one very salient dream about uh, a very vivid one. And I had, and I, then I would spend the days after I had that dream trying to analyze it, trying to analyze the meaning of it. And it's amazing how easy it was to analyze it once I said, 
this happened in the dream, and then I said, well, I felt anxiety, great anxiety at this point. And I said, why do I feel great anxiety at that point? And uh, I could almost not tell you this without telling you the dreams, which makes it, you know, make the dream, which makes it very involved, with, and also highly personal. I don't know to what extent I want to get into it, but. Let me say that over a period of time, I found out what my characterological problem was, what was bothering me. I found out that what bothered me, what was bothering me was that I was, I was uh, living by delegated powers. I found out that my power sources were, in effect, not my own, and that they were, in effect, defunct. And I did this over a period of several years with a gradually increasing intensity of revelation about myself. And I think that when, if you talk about a, a, an analysis, what you do, what you're revealing to the person is his lack of independence, his conditioning, his fears, and what his power source is. And I found out that my power source was not, uh, was not what I thought it was. It wasn't in me. And this was just a shattering revelation to me. And uh, I kept analyzing my dreams for years after that, and all I got was just more, more support for that idea. And uh, so I had to consciously then find a find a uh, a way out of this dilemma. And it was at that point that I began exploring other dimensions of uh, of reality, like the theological dimension. So. What it means, what it means when you have a tremendous anxiety attack. Well, that's something that uh, that one can figure out, I think, if one if one goes through this this kind of regimen. I don't know. I don't know how. I asked Chris Pearls once. I said, "Do you believe it's possible for one to be self-analyzed?" He said, "No." And he said, "Well, maybe in very rare instances it might be." I think I was one of the sort of the little rare instances where I was able to, to reveal to myself my dependence on, on powers that were not mine. Mm -hmm. Then when you're thrown back on yourself, well, what can you do except to reach out then for for uh, for more for other kinds of power? But then you do it in a very honest, open way. You see, you're not doing it in a reflexive way at all. And yeah. Like, right, this is the difference. I mean, I think this is the difference between. Uh, fundamentalist evangelical religiosity, where you're reaching for other powers, is is, uh, is imprinted on you more or less. And genuine religiosity, where you reach for God because there's nothing left. Mm -hmm. 